Oh, I didn't see you. Sorry. All right, let's pray. So, Father, we thank you for uh, this day. Thank you for the opportunity that we have uh, to be gathered with you. Thank you for the chance to just have every moment that we have gained through these years and opportunities to walk with you and to know you as you have shown yourself and your word to us. And we just thank you for just your love and provision and you continue to expound that in our hearts and minds. So we ask you to be able to encourage us, restore us, continue to revive us in these days. And as we know, every day that we live and breathe, it's just one step closer and closer to when ultimately this reality becomes the past and the new reality becomes our our present. So every time I think about that, I just remind ourselves of the conversation between Elihu and Job and how he was living, the, the man of faith, the greatest of us on this planet at the time. And Elihu reminded him that any day be, becomes, your, becomes your future from what the present becomes the future just in a moment. And we live in that reality, what we know to be true. So keep us in steadfastness in our thought, in our our actions and everything about ourselves and just make, making sure that we're ready for you to come and, and take us to be with you. And thank you for your provision, ongoing continuation of uh, long-suffering with us, continuing to forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, pick us up, brush us off, restore us again. Just thank you for keeping us close together with you. Be with us now as our pastor, our teacher, our counselor, our guide, our shepherd, our everything. It is uh, your congregation and your people and it is your lesson and your book. And we ask that you continue to guide and direct us in a way that you're right, in your, for, your, for your name's sake and your paths of righteousness. So, Father, we thank you for, again, all these things we ask in Jesus, this year's name. Amen. All right, so today's lesson, as we have, if you realize we didn't do a Q&A for February, um, the thought was to do a review for tonight over chapters 2 and 3 because we missed review of chapter 2 and we just did chapter 3 and the way that that was done. I kind of was uh, going on a good clip there. <laughs> if you heard the recording or if you were live, you, you know that's what happened. Um, I was pretty much going tortoise and the hare, more on the hare side and clipping on that one, like I was, uh, like I was doing a speech uh, sprint with Usain Bolt or something. It was pretty fast. So sorry about that. Uh, that always happens to me, and I get a little bit uh, quick and speedy, uh, given um, different mix of audience. So. I thought for many reasons, including that and among others, I think it's good to just do a review of where we're at in the book of Philippians. So as we go through, um, there's, no re there's no reason for me right now, I can't speak. <laughs> there's no reason for me now to use the board given the fact that this is a review of what we've already written on the board from chapters two and three, but I wanna make sure I highlight certain things and uh, aspects of what we have talked about from Philippians. So. First things first is just to remind us of uh, things, you know, let, let's compare things from the standpoint of what does Christianity tell us about Philippians and then what does the actual book pertain to. So let's take a backdrop as an overall review and remind ourselves that uh, when you look at regular Christianity, and when I say that, I don't mean that as a condescending remark. I mean that as a tongue-in-cheek sense of how things have been amalgamated together among different denominations. There seems to be a common thread of no really concern nor desire uh, to get really deep into the Word of God and what it means. Uh, some would want to honor the language. I'm going to give them credit for that. Some would want to honor the history. I give them credit for that. But for the, for the most part, the masses uh, do not want to know the history or the, or the deeper uh, language aspects or the contextual premise from which is being spoken. Secondly, they want a generalized message that applies to everybody the same. And thirdly, they want a message that makes them feel good or has some kind of a sense of, let, let's pick me up. So when you have that, you, you tend to miss what's being said, misconstrue what's being, what you do understand what's being said. And then worst of all, you, you then fit everything into a message of one positive thing when sometimes there's charges to us that aren't negative. They're just calls for sobriety, calls for introspection. And those don't seem to be highlighted as much. Um, and all that's because the whole learning process starts from diving into, and I remember uh, someone asked me uh, recently, uh, they asked me, you know, how do you know this, or you sound different, or the person I talked to for the first time in my life this week, I told her, I said, I'm gonna mention this to people, and they're gonna be not surprised because this happens to me on occasions. Uh, this person I hadn't talked to ever in my life before, uh, she, uh, through work, called in for a different uh, situation, 
at about mm, half hour, 40 minutes into that conversation from what she needed to have done from a worldly business uh, concern of things. So that was addressed. And then for the next hour and a half, uh, we were on a phone call about the Bible, about the good Lord, about scripture. So, yes, right, you heard me, an hour and a half uh, after that. So now, is that something I just always do? N not really, uh, but it happens. And it pretty much sounds long-winded, right? <laughs> So, but the thing is that that conversation just kind of ebbed and flowed and, and she said that she noticed that, you know, there was a difference there. And I remember saying to her, I said, because, you know, she asked how I know, I said, I, I won't forget, if I haven't said it enough, I, it bears repeating if I haven't said this before, but we were in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I remember uh, looking at these people that were like usually all 50 plus years of old, years of age, excuse me, years of old, listen to me, years of age, 50 years plus, and those two couples, I think maybe that's most that were in the younger crowd, um, but most of them were just like that, and they were just Bibles worn out, you know, just written all over. And I'm like, what gives? What goes on here? What, what's up? Did y'all go to school or something? They go, well, regular school. No, I mean like to go to seminary or something. I know. I remember they said this to me. They said, read, read the Bible every day with the intent to learn and be changed and be subjective to whatever God says to you. And do that every day. And then you realize every day when you do that, you realize after a week, Boy, all the stuff I didn't know. Do that for a week, and then all of a sudden, you'll realize, wow, two weeks later, three weeks later, a month later, wow, there's so much I didn't realize. Do that for a whole year. Then you'll realize, wow, there's so much more that I never knew. How much more is left for me to understand? And that became the premise for how God you know, prompted in our lives, babes and I, to just continue on this journey that we're on today. And that was back in 1993. Never forget it. And it was the beginning, two years into our, uh, our marriage, uh, and three years into my walk with the Lord, boom, he just takes me on a different level of, uh, hey, by the way. I'm like, what? And so that premise of studying and reading and wanting to get to know God, that's been lost in churchianity. That's what I, when I say churchianity, that's what I mean. I don't, people always say, what do you mean when you say that? I, I mean that people don't have that intent. They don't have that desire. They don't have that understanding uh, or, or that focus. And one of Paul's comments in chapter 3, he said it was the scopizo, and we get our word, our scope for that from a rifle. And so that rifle scope, that, that hairs, the crosshairs, right? So Paul says he was so laser focused, shoo, it's like looking through a crosshairs of a scope. That's to him how focused he is on the prize of the above calling, which is the calling of the heavens, the above, the that which is the not just the invitation to the Ariston, but to achieve the nature of the Dipnon to have the closeness and intimacy with Christ. He, he's, he's laser locked on that bad boy. No matter the oppression of prison, no matter the hatred of other Jewish brethren, no matter the indifference of people in Christ wanting him to always pay for his past sins in Corinth, his fractured relationship with Barnabas, his ongoing lessons, he has to learn how to be a mentor and be a better father, figure and mentor to all these other different people. He had a lot of stress on a duress. He says, yeah, get it, got it, acknowledge it. I'm laser focused and the crosshairs, that's, that's where my eyes at. You're like, whoa, excuse me. He's acknowledging as, as there's an avalanche. Yeah, I know, there's a grizzly bear, Baron Dominey, uh, four by four uh, yards away, da, 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 going 80 miles, you know, <laughs> I mean, he knows all that's going on. He's like, yeah, but I got this in my scope right now. Nothing's gonna bother me, nothing's gonna affect me from still getting the target. Like, that's some serious, I mean, it could be like hot molten lava coming behind him. He's like, yeah, got it, I got it. So right here, I'm like, really? So Paul's saying that nothing is affecting his ability just to continue to just focus out ahead to a land, to a future, to a time, to a place, to a spiritual situation and condition that he's looking to have ultimately not to see what's in God's hand, just to be more with God in Christ. So that type of premise has not been, I think, even understood, uh, let alone focused on by people in church Sandy. So when they read Philippians, they think about Tim Tebow, great guy, wonderful guy, uh, does a lot, is a great uh, uh, witness and testimony for people of faith, especially in the sports world. But he's more in faith, people realize. And um, great guy, as other stories I hear. But the reality is he, he made this book popular, you know, by I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13, you know, it's on his, you know, I, he's on his brow, he used to do that. Then you have, sorry about that. Then you have aspects of, uh, that's a computer in the back room that hurt. Then you have aspects of people that use Philippians to, to, 
to, as a reference to talk about Christ and being humbled and obedient to death on a cross and how I thank God for memories of you always, you know? So they, they make all these, the people take, they like the verses and what they mean, but no one bothers to stop and, and, and do what we did before when God showed us at the very beginning of the book, Paul started off the relationship issue. And that was a big deal. It was a huge deal. And if you just, it, I can't even, I, I can't speak enough to, to the fact that these things mean something. The, the, the lens from which a story is told matters. The vantage point, the experience from which God uses a man or a woman to therefore communicate a truth matters. But to the majority of people in churchianity, it doesn't matter. But it's no surprise because the reality is that it kind of matters, but they don't want to know the depth of it because the depth of it means that are you saying therefore the words also are like, kind, different in how they're measured and how they're understood and who he's talking to? Yes, yes, I am saying that. Then they go, oh, man, come on. It's a general message of a general loving kindness of a loving God to all of us that are the same. No, it's not. And so Philippians is, is one of the most oft quoted, oft gone to books for a nicety of encouragement, for a nicety of, of, of peace. Uh, and so people tend to always see this amongst every scripture, every book in the Bible, as how they could take a nicety and just kind of soothe their soul. It's like a Linus blanket type of thing. You know, they just want to gather up and get cozy and, and have a good warm cup of cocoa or something. But the reality is that Philippians is written about a relationship. He starts off chapter 1, verse 1, about Timothy being a bondsman. We know he builds on this whole issue of saying the foundation was love. But in chapter 2, he takes it a step further, as we already talked about chapter 1 before. But in chapter 2, he takes it a step further, and he, and he goes into the, the, the mindset that we have to have. He mentions Timothy and Epaphroditus specifically in chapter 2. After he talks about the mindset, he talks about Christ. He talks about how we should be fearful and trembling our salvation. And he goes right into after that, describing that only Timothy, he says, only Timothy was a person that was able to care for them and understand the things that he understands that Paul communicated to him in depth of knowledge, but yet also had the depth of care that Paul would have himself if he was there present with him. If that doesn't speak to a relationship, I don't know what does. Because it's one thing, it's like the, in the medical world, they call it bedside manner for a doctor. If you had your choice between a doctor, male or female, who had the depth of knowledge and specialist in their field, but their bedside manner was pathetic versus one who had a great acumen of like kind kindred spirit in their knowledge of their field, but also had a great bedside manner, we'd always want the other, we want both of those things. We want the acumen and the bedside manner. Thank you if I had a choice, right? But the acumen itself is needed to be able to heal and help. But we don't even have that. That's the teaching of God's word. That's the exegesis of God's word, the, the letting God's word, like I said earlier, letting it just be coming before God's word and saying, let, let the truth be what it is. Let me, if I need to change, change me, break me, mold me, shatter my previous thoughts and reforge new ones in me. Be willing to let me accept whatever you want, want to challenge me, change me, and convict me of. I don't care. Nothing is off limits, God. Let you and you alone be the one who's the forger, the, 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 the maker, the reforger, the remaker, the regenerator, the restorer of my soul. Not me, not my previous thinking, not my tradition, not my folks, not my great grand folks, not my church family, and all this kind of stuff. None of that. None of that. Because none of that's going to matter when you're standing before Him. And so there's all this sense of. In Philippians, he, he's wanting them to, to realize some depth of things that back then was not so hard to communicate. It's so difficult in our day to communicate what's being said in Philippians because there's such a mundanely passed upon from generation, 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 a missing of understanding of what was being sown as the truth in God's word. So now we've got to work so hard. It's like we're trying to excavate a, a lost city that no one believes was there. And we're standing on it, and it's underneath our feet. And we know it's there. We know it's there. Everybody else goes, oh, I see it's sand. Oh, my. There's a city, there's a till underneath here, man. Come on, dude. There, there's, I've already shown you some fragments of buildings. Those not mean it's a big city. You're like, oh, my gosh, it does. If I just showed you the top of a roof, it does mean there's a city. There's, there's buildings, right? I mean, you know. So it's just so many things we can show from the scriptural context of this book 
And Paul's bringing out the fact that this is important because he's bringing out how we should vet ourselves in chapter one. And in chapter two, he starts off as a review of this. And he says, if there being any comfort, he talked about, again, and he talked about the deep-rooted emotion, comfort in Christ, soothing of love, participation in the spirit, any sympathies and compassions. Talk about being united in soul. So of all the knowledge he talked about in chapter one, the foundation, he said, of your knowledge and of your discernment was on love. Not just love, but the love. Not just love of God, but the love that comes from the deep of the depth of the knowledge. But then he talks about in chapter 2, how do, you, how do you live out that? It's about the behavioral process of it. Well, Jesus had that same phrasing in, in Matthew 9 when he said he had compassion, or this word as we saw in chapter 2, verse 1, these sympathies, this, this splagshon. This is a deeper empathy that's, that's from deep within that you have this emotional like an impact when you hear somebody or see somebody go through exploitation, go through abuse, go through condescension, go through just being used by the world, but even more so by those in Christ, even more so those who ostracize people in Christ because of what they believe. It's bad enough when they do it because of how we look, how we talk, how we walk, what we wear, what we don't wear, what we don't say, or we don't talk, whatever. It's even worse when you do it because of what, because that stuff is kind of handed down in tradition, culture stuff. But your belief, that's imparted by God. And when you insult the way my father made me think and has me see things in his word and about him, that, that, that can hurt. That can hurt a lot. And so Paul's saying, you know, you, you got to have that sense of understanding that they were doing that to Jesus, weren't they? They weren't picking on how he walked and how he talked and what he wore. They're picking on what he taught. What authority do you teach this? And he said, <laughs> you tell me. What authority John the Baptist teach? I can't speak up. That was the issue, right? The issue was, <laughs> what are you speaking from? <laughs> yes, you are. He's like, oh, really? We're going to play this game. Okay. What authority did John the Baptist speak? Everything I spoke, at the end, and when they accused him, what did he say? Everything I spoke, I spoke openly. So when people ask me and they ask you, Hey, why are you such a small group when you have a building? You guys, you have a building that's there, but, it's, but there's empty seats a, a lot of times, right? A lot of them. Why is there an online website when it's just you guys? Because the Lord made it clear that what we teach, we teach openly. But your light shall shine before men, that they glorify your Father in heaven. They may see your good works, right? Well, I'm not hiding. We're not hiding. No. Did God give us secrets and mysteries of understanding? Yes. Do we hide that? No. Now, how God leads to those places, that's up to him. He's done this before I was alive, and you. He'll do this after we're dead or move removed from this planet. He's done his job with or without us pretty, pretty well. He doesn't need us, but he just chooses to love us, and he can't help himself, but to continue to use this collaborative process of his creation in him always engaging. And Paul's talking about that relationship, about us to each other, and it starts with having that sense of depth of empathy that Christ had to others that were being ostracized by society. We just had that same sense of empathy for those with special needs, for those of exploitation, whatever the situation is. You do the same thing for people who have that sense of, hey, if they're being spiritually attacked for what they believe. It goes to that situation too. We all know what that's like. So we're supposed to have a sense of deeper empathy for understanding what that's like. Then he goes into talking about being united in soul in chapter 2, and he talks about uh, chapter 2, verse 2, but he, he goes into what Jesus talked about, how Jesus didn't even consider himself even of a person of free will to have that sense of, of doing that, but yet of taking on God's you know, equality of, of confronting him as God the Son. And yet here we are as his creation, having the audacity to act like, why did you do this to me, God? Why did you bring me into that family? Why did you bring me into that situation? Why do you not make this part of my life better? He's going, are you kidding me? He himself subjected himself to hardship so that you and I can never say, yeah, it must be nice to be the creator. Really? Would you, if you, or you, if you were the creator, would you have subjected yourself to such hateful, malicious, evil working of your own creation against you? Really, would you? I wouldn't have. I, I'd have brought the whipping stick, yes. Needs us to help him to build his kingdom, Sam <laughs> said. They 
Yeah. The lady said, further in the kingdom. Yeah, I know, right? They say that, right? And that's the whole thing. And, then, and so this churchianity movement has this sense of we are needed to share his love and to, to further his kingdom and to, and to be a beacon of God's love. And, and, I, and, and one person said to me the other day, another person that I met, I met face to face for the first time in my life, sweet spirit, very sweet spirit, tremendously sweet, nothing taken away. I mean that in all honesty. But he said to me, all that matters when it's all boiled down is love. And there's a song out with these people singing. They go, the pastor got up, and he said, love, love, love. And I learned more from that lesson that day because he said, love, love, love. And I'm like, that, that's your song? Are you kidding me right now? No, I get what you're saying. That what, that's what Paul is saying in chapter 1, verse 9. But I remember distinctly Paul saying that was the foundation from which to build on knowledge and deeper perception of this discernment. It didn't seem like he said, on love, build love, love, love. That's not what he said. Because the point is, Jesus came with grace and truth. God is love, but he's also the truth. You cannot love apart from truth. Truth is a person just like love is a person. To try to love without truth is trying to separate God the Father and God the Son and rip them apart. You are insane. You can't do that. It cannot be done. They are, they are one, just like love and truth are two sides of the same coin. You cannot throw away one or suppress the one and exalt the other and act like that's okay. It's impossible and it's not okay. Yes. Uh, lady said the kingdom is in our hearts. Yeah. And then she said, love, 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 and to get in my way on the highway. Yeah, now you're on to me now, see. That, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, trust I, right? But, but it's, it's the way that the Lord's talking about the, the, the truth and the love that, that we have to have together. And so when he said that to me, this sweethearted person about things in, in, in Christianity, he said, that's the problem with Christianity today. You just, have, you just have to have more love. Love solves everything. And I said, it doesn't solve everything. It's, it's almost like, okay, love is the medicine, but truth is the, is the physician that applies it the right way. If you don't believe that, take any milligrams you want for blood pressure. Just any, just, just choose one. Doesn't matter. See what happens. Yeah, you might die. Not funny. Not funny. Same with blood sugar medication and so on. The medication works. How it's applied matters, doesn't it? It's the same way with love. Love is the core, is, is, is the remedy, is the bomb God uses. But how God uses that bomb, how he applies that bomb, matters. That's where truth comes in. So folks who scratch their head and go, I don't understand what you mean when you say a love with truth. How it is applied. That's what I mean. That's what, not, that's how, that's what Christ is talking about. That's why God so loved the world. Does it stop there? Nope. That he gave. How love was applied is he subjected himself, as Philippians is talking about, to not just any subjection, but to the lowest form of humanity. He came as a fetus to prove to all of us that are in this world, this whole pro-life, pro-choice movement is insanity. No. No. He was telling you he was, a, he was a person, he was a human inside the womb from day one. Don't give me this garbage that it's not a person. It, it's a person. All babies. From conception, moment one, boom, human. To have a soul. And for women who say, no offense to you, I got, God love you. And you say, it's my body, my choice. I'll tell you what, uh, prove to me again, I've, I said before, move your abdomen, show me how you form the eyes and nose and the soul and personality. But I digress. How about this? How about you show me how, um, that it's your body. How, how did you make your body? How did you wire your neurons and your circulatory system? Go ahead. Explain it to me. How did you do it? Because it is your body, right? 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 So it's, it's like it's like it's your car you bought from the store or your house, but you bought that with financial compensation, exchange, right? What did you exchange to purchase your body? Nothing. So how did it get made then? It's, the, it's brought to you by the grant from the God Loves You Foundation. It's brought to you by the grant that God's the creator of all life foundation. You have the audacity to act like you're the creator. How dare you? Your body. No, that's a joke. That's a sham. That's a farce of a comment. 
It is not your body because you didn't make it. And if you can prove to me you've made it, then I will concede it's your body. Otherwise, stop the malarkey. Stop it. You will, it's my car, I didn't make it. But you purchased it, didn't you? What did you do to purchase your body? What did you do? Nothing. Nothing. Show me how you manufactured a solar offset some exchange between you and God to make a life. Come on, man. So this is all insanity, but Christ is telling us from the very beginning he was divested in verse 7. He became obedient, submissive in this way, all the way to the cross. So Christ wanted us to know that from the fetus inside the womb all the way to the cross of Calvary and everything in between that we don't know about because a lot of details weren't written when he was a young boy, all the things he went through, all the things he experienced, all the things he, he subjected himself to, that means that he would run and fall, stub his toe, scratch his knee. Kids made fun of him. He subjected himself to all of that. But more importantly, there was great days, fun and laughter, family hugs, celebratory processes, nothing but warmth and compassion around. But he was still subjected in a finite body of a little tiny human being. Being God Almighty, that's kind of a big deal. It's a big deal to be confined inside of a little tiny body and growing up. Wh who would do that? If you were the creator, you tell me you would do that. Don't lie. No, you wouldn't. I wouldn't do it. I'm just being honest. If you're going to tell me you would do it, don't cheat and use the Bible as your cheat sheet. Why would you do it, really? If you're going to say, yes, I would have. Really? Why would you? Why? Why would you do that? In what part of your life have you mirrored anything else close to that that would make me believe that you would do that given you would take something that's highly, 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 highly off the chart valuable about defining who you are, and you would take it and just utterly put it at the subjection of being utterly destroyed and devalued by someone else. When have you ever done that in your life? I, I haven't done that. Oh, like ever. You, 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 really? God did that. That's what Paul's making clear to us. We, we kind of don't get it. He took everything that's his entire essence, his entire being, the most valuable thing that this the, 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 the creation has ever known, the creator himself. I, I can't even fathom even saying it. He subjected himself to the finiteness of our limited body and form. Blah, blah, blah. Weird. Why? Why? Well, that part's love. Yeah. That's, that's the bomb. He manifested himself in that way to show love. And why was, that, wh why was that method of love necessary? Because he wanted to, to personally, face to face, with the intimation of physical body language, tone of voice, and the content of his, te of his lessons, he wanted you to hear, see, and feel, and know the teaching. Not just hear from the heavens, I am God, I am for the Father, listen to me. Samuel, Samuel, wake up, Samuel. No, no. That, that's great and all that, and that's awesome. Don't get me wrong. Moses, take off your sandals. You're on holy ground. Whatever God sounds, I don't know. But the point is, when he's face to face with you, and you get to embrace the creator, what? They hugged him, man. Can you imagine that woman who grabbed his hem? I wonder what she felt. Was it like putting your hand in a socket? Did she go, <laughs> It must have felt, I mean, it must have been a charge beyond compare. It's like touching a nuclear power plant and not dying. <laughs> I can imagine the surge he must have felt <sighs> all through her body. And then that was truly like electrifying, if you will. Okay? It's amazing how God put himself on this planet in a way that was personally interacting with his creation. And I jest about people saying when, he's in, when he was in the desert, do you think the little critters walked by? The little lizards and the cactus, scorpions was there. The scorpion goes, hey, man, thanks for the hard shell and the hot sun allowed me to live out here. This place is hot. He's like, you're welcome. Snake goes by, hey, man, you know it wasn't me. It's my ancestors that he used. You know, Of course I know that. You're welcome. I didn't kill you. You got it. You know what I mean? I wonder if he had talk. You know, I wonder if he was just out there looking at his creation, just looking at take it. We don't know what happened. But if I'm, the, if I'm the artist and I made a masterpiece, an artist always, always appreciates their handiwork. And we know God does. 
because God rested on the seventh day as if to sit back and just take in his creation. So I wonder if he was in that 40 days of, of wandering in the wilderness, uh, uh, being tempted, I should say, in the wilderness. I wonder if he was in those moments alone when he went to go pray, if those were times not just of prayer, which they were, but also times of reflection on his creation, about looking at us and having the things of nature, plant life, animal life, and us. I wonder if he had to ask himself, do they really get it? Do they understand the gravity of the situation? That the very essence of all life is in front of them? That the very thing that creates all of this and sustains all of this and holds all of this and the palm of my hand, like, like that, he can lose every atom, every lepton, every single particle. He stands right in front of you. When you were around in those days, he's walking around. It's insane. Do you think they really understood that? I don't think so. They didn't get it. They didn't get it. When he rose from the dead, they surely got it. It took them a while, right? They didn't believe. But just imagine, that's what Paul's trying to help us understand. Do you really understand the depth of what that is? And why wouldn't you, if understanding that and contemplating that, why wouldn't you want to vet yourself for the day in which you, guess what, <coughs> meet him? Isn't it funny how people go, oh, I'm getting married, I gotta lose weight, gotta lose weight, gotta lose weight. I'm getting married, you know, gotta lose weight. Oh, I'm getting invited. I'm going to the Royal Wedding in England. I'm going to look my best, get my best dress. Oh, I'm going to this big gala with my, with my buddies at this big thing for work or for whatever. Got to look my best. Oh, I'm going to go to the White House, meet the president. Got to look my best. Y you're going to meet the creator. You, you, so how much more should you look your best? Just saying. That's why in chapter 1, Paul said, hello, telekinesis. Why don't you guys vet yourself, please? Would you please understand what's at stake here? It is this insane. You think the White House pats you down for weapons and for all that stuff? You think that's scary? Or you think that's, you know, thorough? That ain't nothing, Jack. He's going to pat you down all right to make sure you're worthy to see where your heart is, to see where your spirit is, to see where your righteousness is, to see what you really desire. Is your scopus, is your, and the crosshairs of your life that you've been focusing on wanting to really know him? Do you really see that meeting? Can you envision that meeting in your mind one day that you want to be? He's inviting you to a heavenly feast of an Ariston. Do you really get the fact it's the greatest wedding above all weddings? It's the, it's the royalty of all royalties of all royalties of all royalties times a gazillion weddings of all time. You're invited. Not everybody's invited, but you are. So am I. Yowza! And so Paul's reminding us, do you realize that before the wedding, the king stepped off the throne and went into the commoner's place and played the role of the homeless, vagabond, ostracized, regular villager? What? Yeah. No way. Why'd he do that? so that we'd be invited. What? Because if he didn't, we would never be invited. But we just wouldn't. Oh, man. What? Do you want to know that kind of a king? Do you want to know that type of a father? Do you want to know that creator? Because that's what we're talking about. So that's what he's talking about in chapter 2, about that's why relationship's so important. That's why he kind of dawned on him about the sense of, yeah, truth's important, the mysteries and the secrets and the depth of God's word is important. But it has to be based on that foundation of love. So that do I, am I learning all this just to learn it? Am I understanding all this just to grow in my knowledge? Just to say that I, I, I'm more uh, exposed to things that are different and I see things differently and understand the God's work differently and therefore I see, I see error when I see error. I see truth when I see truth. All that's great. But is, it, is that the reason? I don't know your heart. Only God knows that. All right, why, why are you doing it? Are you really doing it, Paul's saying, to get to the core of having a deeper walk with Christ? Or is it just to say, look, I belong to the same mindset of, I, I got the secrets, I got the mysteries. Boy, aren't I fortunate. Boy, am I grateful. Is that what it is? Or is, it, is there a depth of understanding of desire like Paul had in the crosshairs? Is there a crosshairs in your mindset that all around you is this truth and this knowledge and this poured out wisdom? And you do acknowledge it, but whew, it's Christ and Christ alone that's in your crosshairs because all of that that's so true has made it all the more reasons why you should just be so focused because if he's telling you all that and that's all the truth that comes out of him and it's about him, how much grander would it be to meet him? 
to be with him. That's what Paul's talking about. And so he's talking about that in chapter 2, and he goes on in, in chapter uh, 2, verse 12, and he, he mentions how we have always, they have always obeyed this beloved, these, these Adelphos, these brethren that are those brethren in, in, in Philippi. I love in verse 13 when he said, God is working effectuously. He's ongoingly under, putting us under construction. Again, the relationship. You don't arrive, it's ongoing. He talks about that God is, in verse 16, exhibiting, exhibiting the word of life, taking that word, taking heed, holding fast. And I love when he says, he, is, he did not run in vain nor labored in vain. That's that word, that, that phrasing, that the relationship work is not just, when some people, I love when people say, I, I mean facetiously, people say, oh, I, I can't do anymore. That relationship is just not, I, 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 I've done all I can do. I'm done. I'm like, you're done. Wait a minute. Boundaries are good when someone's trying to exploit you and abuse you. I get that. But when someone's reaching out to you, when someone is wanting to desire a relationship with you, you can never say, I'm done. You can't do that. You can't do that. You just can't. You just can't. Because Paul's saying right here in verse 16, chapter 2, look, guys, the exhausting, spent, physical energy that's at, that's at the imagery of that sense of fight and that sense of pursuing something that brings you to the place of just mental, physical, spiritual fatigue, trust me, it's worth it all in the end. Because you're not doing it for that person. You're not doing it for you. You're doing it because that's what God expects you to do because the process from which you are living and acting and behaving according to what he has called you to be and do is what you're measured by. Not the results. The process. Are you doing your role and your responsibility? Are you checking the boxes internally from a genuine, not, art, not, a, not, a, not a flippancy check, but you're, are you really believing in that purpose of doing that for the relationship? As we go on further on, he talks about again, from in chapter 2, he talks about, again, we mentioned Timothy and Epaphroditus and how they were, and Epaphroditus in verse 26 was depressed. And again, he didn't want anybody to know about it in verse 26. Remember? He was near death, death death's doorstep. So, so many folks would say, depression's not real. Anxiety's not real. Put a little Jesus on it. He'd be free, hallelujah. Well, wait a second. Epaphroditus was a co soldier and a co worker with Paul. He was doing the work with Paul. He put his own, his own life at harm's way to love and assist Paul. He dealt with the same pain and anguish and hatred that Paul dealt with, hence the term fellow soldier. And he suffered depression. He suffered from some pain and anguish. See, people say, oh, really? A matured person in faith, a person of great fruit yield, 60 fruit minimum, maybe even higher than that, a sperma. This man. Suffered with depression. He said, oh, not possible. Yes, possible. Because he was strained and stressed and pressed from all sides. It's possible. But folks who say, oh my gosh, that's not, it's not, that's not Christian. Well, you don't understand what it's like to be hated and ostracized and put your life on the line for what you believe, for what God has given you. Now remember what I'm saying here. Now remember, don't take what I'm saying about being depressed and relate it to just anything in life. It's just like the suffering. We don't, we, don't, we don't experience his sufferings, and you can't equate experiencing your sufferings or my sufferings on, this, on the account of someone who abused us or exploited us. Those are sufferings. Those are pains. Those can cause depressions, no doubt. But the depression he's talking about here and the suffering he talks about in the book is dealing with the spiritual connection directly because of what God has shown you about himself and what he has given you as a truth in his word and because of that, the sufferings become deeperly, they become deeper cut in you. Because it hurts to know that the hatred, the animus, the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual duress you are experiencing is because of someone's inability or lack of even desire or wantingness to accept who God is from how he has shown himself to you or even hear what he has to say and what he's opened up to you in his word. And so they take it out on you as displaced anger against you because you're the conduit, you're the vessel who spoke it or was a witness to it. That hurts. You think you're just a battering ram. You're just caught in the crossfire. It's like you're the soldier in the king's war and all the crossfire is coming at you when he's up in the castle. You're like, wait, that hurts, man. 
I'm, I'm here on his bequest. I'm not here for me. Why, why all the arrows at me? And they would say to you, because you're in the front line, son. That's where the war's at. Well, geez. And that's why the scripture reminds us of Ephesians. Paul said earlier that our fight's not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in high places, right? We're fighting this battle down at the ground level, but it's actually, it's actually the king we serve. So there's no battle with him. We're the ones who incur battles amongst each other because demons are behind that. Spiritual emissaries are behind that. Daenerys influences are behind that. Oof. So here he says in chapter 2 again that he talks about in verse uh, 29 to receive Epaphroditus as a person who was, again, with joy and with honor, and that joy is that ongoing bubbling over joy to, to have that sense of letting somebody know the best way to help somebody who's going through a depression, the best way to, to Paul say, hey, relationship with Christ, what's he saying? Why would he point out Epaphroditus being that way? I contend that Paul himself had his moments. I don't see how he couldn't have. I could contest to you that I believe, I can prove he did, and he wrote the, the letters he wrote to Corinth. He suffered with some depression because he was constantly questioning some things about why they would continually not let it go, his past, when he continued to confess and make right by what he had done wrong. Some people don't let you ever for be forgiven. Some people never want to let, let it down, let, let you down, excuse me, let you go with, let it go from what you have done. They don't want to, you know, let, let, let you live it down, I should say. And so they just want to continue to berate you and pound you and pound you in the ground. People are like that. I've told the grandkids when they were growing up, I said there's two kinds of people in the world. There's those that build themselves up by tearing other people down. Please don't be that person. Be the other one that builds yourself up by building others up around you. And they lift you up and you're lifted up together. That's the right way to do it. But unfortunately, the way corporate America works, the way church entity works, the way our fleshly sinful mind works, we want to tear people down because it's easier to be built up that way. And it's no different in church entity. No different. It's our human condition. We're just evil like that. It's what we do. But he goes on, talks about not only is, it, is, that, is that relationship important, talks about, about how we should have our innermost beings be more like Christ and how we had that, me that mentality of empathy toward each other. Then he talks about how Timothy and Epaphroditus had two views of how they were, again, close to him. Epaphroditus is a great, strong, fruitful, bearing, knowledgeable man, and yet he suffered with depression. But Paul said all the more reason when he's restored you receive that person with joy. What happens in church today? Not only do we say, that's not Christian. Well, they say that person's just weak. Weak? Or, worse yet, they say, okay, that's, that's, he, he's a believer in Christ. Okay, he's not weak. But you're put off by him when you see him. And you're, you don't want to be anywhere near him. They know that vibe. Everybody knows that vibe when you're in, that, when you're in a room of people that don't want to be around you. When you walk in the room of people that, that don't want to be near you because you bring them down, they would say, or, or they're, not, they're not on your level of ha rah rah cheer cheer well, Maybe sometimes they need you to pick them up. Maybe they need that hugging embrace. They need that arm around them, let them know. So lesson learned, I think Paul's saying is, in a nutshell in chapter, chapter 2 was, guys, stop looking through your lens of how someone should be and live and start relating and identifying that's what Jesus did when he came down as God the Son, as God Almighty. Far be it from us not to do likewise. Epaphroditus needs your love and support. Relate and identify with him. Don't think less of him. It's not appropriate. It's highly inappropriate, given who you are. Yes? Yeah, they think, yeah, that people think depression is unconfessed sin, whereas in Epaphroditus' case, that wasn't the case at all. It wasn't unconfessed. It was just it was just because of the constant berating of the suffering because of what he believed. And the reason why people don't understand that is because when only a few are given the insight into the depth of who God is in his word to the level like Epaphroditus was, if you're if you're of the single digit percent of people that have been shown the depth of who God is in his word. And the majority, 90-something percent, don't see that. Then, therefore, how could they understand the experience that you experience hurts you even more than it hurts them? How can they understand, therefore, the attack that comes against you because of what you believe and because of what you understand who God is and what his word says? How can they understand the vitriol and, and, the, and the malice and the bitterness that, that is forced against you by those you love, your own brethren, Jewish people? 
How could they know what it's like to see somebody else who is, who is being beaten and flogged and hated? Epaphroditus, to his brother Paul. What does that do to his soul? Peter says that Lot was vexed in his soul. Vexed to the core. And Lot, God give him credit, he was a righteous man from a general standpoint, but he was nowhere near the death of Epaphroditus. How much more would he have been vexed, given the circumstance? He would say, well, that, well, I wouldn't be vexed. You wouldn't understand. It's almost like me, again, at the pool, and I go, man, I'd have won that race. Too bad I lost that race. And I go, I know what it's like to be Michael Phelps losing by a hair of his hand on the edge of the pool. No, I don't. No, I don't. Come on, man. No, it's not even close to the same thing. Not even close. Not even close. I use Olympics all the time because it's the number one thing in all of this athletic world around us that all countries understand. All the best of all humans participate. And yet, if you can sit there and have the audacity of ignorance to think it's the same thing with the time, the effort, the sacrifice, the energy that person puts into it is much greater than the average Joe or Jane. And you're going to sit there and say, when you experience a loss, it's no different than them? You're insane. You're insane. And you're unteachable if you continue to persist on that being the same thing. It's not the same thing. Well, how it feels is different, how you experience it differently, because it takes a whole different measure of, of, of qualifying events to get to that point. It's no different than a spiritual life. It's even more so different in the spiritual life, off the chart different, because we're at a higher level of competition, if you will, in the spiritual realm of the, of the animus around us, of the spiritual hierarchy of evils against us. It's all out to take us down. We got Satanus coming after us. Is he coming after the other people? No. Diabolos goes after people that are, that are in Christ. Satanus, he comes after those who have the secret of the mysteries. He ain't playing. He doesn't just tempt us like Diabolos does. Satanus deceives us. He's a jerk. He's very good at manipulation and deception. Extremely good at it. So we get the tempter who tests us as Diabolos. We all get that in Christ. But then we get the deceiver, the manipulator on top of that at a high level. Oh, thank you very much for that, jerk. And then for those of us who have even a, a, a taste above that, we get a little bit of that Panero's covert influencer that he is. His covert, we don't even see what happened. I mean, we're subjected to some serious spiritual warfare going on, and you're going to tell me that the average person can understand and relate to that. No wonder they would say, oh, it's on confess sin. Oh, my gosh. How could you? <laughs> it's like a person on their couch commenting on the professional athlete who's doing the Olympic Games saying, it's because of this. And you would know how. How would you know that? How do you know? What would be the difference in that, that short, I don't, you know. How would you know? Unless you did that for a living, unless you were once that, how, how would you know? How would you know the depth of what it's taught? You don't know. You're guessing. You're in a general idea. But as people do, they, they, they guess at what depression is from because they don't see it from the lens of who's supposed to be related to, identified with, because you can't relate, identify at a spiritual level. The very least you should do is relate, identify on a human kindness level, that we all have things that we can't bear at times. Now, do you understand the spiritual acumen of somebody who's above you, like if half of that is well as to other people below him on the spiritual rung? Sure they don't, but it doesn't change the fact they can still relate and identify with him with compassion and love. So with Epaphroditus, we see that Paul says, for those of us of the same spiritual acumen, Philippi, he didn't say they weren't doing it right way. He was just reminding them of doing it the way that they know how to do it, to embrace this man, to understand that they understood his depression was, was a natural thing that you go through given the spiritual contest that he was against, against the adversaries, against him, the spiritual places and premises working through men that caused him such consternation that he physically was near death's door. And then when he came back to be restored, he knew, they, they knew how much it would mean to be overwhelmingly, bubbly, joy, joyfully received and hugged and embraced. All the more emphasis on relationship, relationship, relationship. The depth of what you know doesn't matter if you can't filter it into how does that cause you to interact differently with God and with man. If it doesn't change that, you got some serious issues. 
that you have to still work out. And that's what he means by work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out how you live in your life with the fear of knowing the more you know, oh, God ain't playing with you, man. He expects you to act, talk, walk, think differently. If you think that's not the case, you're sadly mistaken. Philippi understood this. Paul's talking about this. So in chapter 3, he goes on and talks about beware of the dogs, those who want to manipulate and exploit you. That's what dogs do. They're scavengers. They take from you. They're users. Beware of verse 2, chapter 3, verse 2, of the evil workers, the people with bad, corrupt character. Beware of the excision, those who want to cling on to old wine and old wineskins, old belief, an old doctrine with an old framework of thought. Don't want to let it go. Beware of those people. And the word beware is look, pay attention. Look, acknowledge them, acknowledge there are, don't lie to yourself. Don't lie to yourself, what he's trying to say. Stop lying to yourself. This world is not filled with people in Christ that are all of, of the same mindset. No, they're not. No, they're not. No, they're not. There's people in Christ, Paul can say, I testify in Corinth, they got issues with me. I'm not, acknowledge, I'm not ignoring that. I'm acknowledging that. There are people that want to manipulate and use you as a means to their end, as an excuse for their behavior, as a reason they don't, can't do this, or as a reason they won't do that. They want to take from you what they can take from you and then leave the rest like a scavenger does. There's those that are evil workers, and they want to just be corrupted in their character around you to bring you down because your bell curve that God's using you to create a different lifestyle of how you think and how you live, they don't like that. They want to bring you down to the rest of them so we don't, we don't go have you float off like Mary Poppins, you know. Let's bring you down from that high lofty tower. We don't like it when you talk and walk and that you act differently. Come down to the rest of us fellas or fillies, right? They want to bring you down to their level because they, they're just corrupt in their character. They want to say, hey, come on. Just do this. Come on. Just come here. Come on. Just let go of that thought of how that God is or what that scripture said. What? Or folks that want to, again, never let go of the old thinking or the old framework of how that fits into that thinking, how that, how that thinking fits into, fits into the framework. They want to keep the old framework of thought, and they want to keep the old things that they thought were true. They don't want to be convinced with new facts because their mind's already made up. Don't give me the facts, right? So he talked about dogs, evil workers, and excision, the false circumcision, those who want to continue to focus on old wine. So there's manipulation, corruption, and people don't want to be unteachable. Be hard-headed. Be stubborn. Be aware of these people. Acknowledge these people exist in Christ. They exist. But why is it bring that up for? And because people say, well, no, I, 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 I get it, man. I know. I know. I know the dogs in my life. I know the workers in my life. I got them all pegged. I know that they're the dogs. See? I got them all pegged. And Paul goes, really? You think that you can get that? If anyone wants to boast in flesh, I could boast more. I was this, this, this. I mean, he's like going, don't peacock on me, my friends. If any of us could peacock and say, oh, yeah, it was me. And I'm telling you, I'm aware of it, but it still hurts me. I'm aware of it, it still bothers me. Don't act like it doesn't exist, and don't you dare act like you know it exists, but it doesn't affect you. Stop the lies. He ends chapter 3 by telling you it affects him. He's mourning, he says, these people whose God is their belly. He's mourning the fact that affects him. So those who go, don't let it affect you, Th then you're not human. You're not where you're supposed to be in your depth of spiritual empathy and relatability, identifying with other people. It hurts because he knows their future is going to be very sad in their destruction. And being in Christ, there's so much they're going to lose. He knows that. How could that not affect you? You just can't flippantly go, oh, you know, whatever. It doesn't work that way. It hurts. When you dwell on it, it hurts. For some folks, it's football season time. It's okay. No, it's not okay, okay? Not everything is just all joker smiles, all right? It's not funny. Some people, unfortunately, are caught in a rut of being like dogs, scavengers, manipulators, takers. 
being like evil workers. They're just corrupt inside. They don't realize it. They keep on wanting to tear people down to their level. They don't want to rise up to where God wants them. Or they're like the excision. They keep on holding on to old belief systems and old frameworks. They don't see themselves for what they are. But Paul says, I, I see it. And it breaks my heart. I don't go, ha, ha, ha. He doesn't do that. He doesn't make fun of them. He doesn't pound them in the ground. He just says it's, it exists. Bleepy, bleepy is the word here. Beware. Acknowledge it. Look and see they exist. It affects them. He goes in and talks about in verse 7 that that's why he says, everything that was gained to me, anything that was profit to me, anything that was profitable, advantageous to me, it's now a hindrance to me. Remember? The word he uses here, he says that he has counted it all as, as loss, but he says that it was a loss. That word is it was a zemia. Because when you focus in on your old belief system, your old truth that you used to know, the character you used to have when you had fun with your buddies or your gals or whatever, the, the, the things that you can gain from scavenging, from taking from others, you kind of justify the good of it all. He says, oh my gosh, when you, when you did that at a very high level, our sin is our worst enemy of what it made us before. It doesn't leave us, by the way. I remember, bless her heart, a lady named Linda from Chattanooga who was the people who say, you can't learn from a woman, that's false. Because I, I know I personally did, and I know that, I still do, and I know that the reality is that Mary Magdalene of the early uh, beginning of the first, the first uh, uh, decade there in the, in the, of the history of, the, of Christianity, she was actually labeled as one of the hierarchy of governmental positions in the congregation. And Paul talks about Priscilla and Aquila not just Aquila, but Priscilla, Phoebe, he said, listen to her in Romans. Women were highly regarded more than we realize, and yet we just discount it, but by, by digress. Linda was the daughter of Ruth, who we learned tons from in Chattanooga. They're all passed on right now. But Linda was an alcoholic, she said. She said she was so drunk sometimes she was just in the streets, laying on the streets outside of a bar, and her parents had to go get her. And God love her. She said this out in the open publicly, so I'm not saying anything that wasn't known for those who ever heard her talk or preach or teach. She didn't preach from the pulpit. She taught Sunday school. And she would always say, I'm a recovering alcoholic. She always would say that. So one day I asked her, why do you keep saying that? Every time you say that, like, you, have you, are you still? She goes, no, you don't understand. I don't touch stuff, never have, because once I go down that path, it'll take me so far, I, I don't, I don't want to even think about it. I said, why do you say you're a recovering alcoholic then? And she said, because it's just the difference between me taking no drink and me taking one. I become one just like that. So I'm constantly a recovering alcoholic because any sin that got a hold of you and it controlled you and it, addict and it made you addicted to it, you're always just a hair away from going right back to it. That's what Paul means when he says the zemia, the previous sins that got so good, you got so good at, whether it was lying, deception, perversions, exploitations, whatever it was you got really good at, and it, and it comforted you in your soul, and it comforted you in your life, and it made you money, or whatever it was, it's a detriment to your spiritual progress because it will always be the bane of your existence. It will remind you. It will remind you. <laughs> but you're good at it. But you thrived, remember? We were happy then. Shut up to your sinful old man, you should say, to your corrupt man inside of you. That's what Paul's talking about. His old man was constantly like coaxing him to say, hey, you know, we were better off. Hey, you, you, you were fantastic. You were, you were awesome off the chart at persecuting people. He even talks about that. He uses the word, he pursued people in verse 6. He pursued them the word diaco, and he says it again in the same way he says that he pursues toward the prize in verse 14. He diacos. What a play on words. He's saying, oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? Well, that, that, that detrimental to me, sinful man, that sinful past that's detrimental to me, that's lost to me, it's all feces, it's dung, it's garbage, it's waste. I'm going to take the trait that was used by my flesh, by sin, by Satan for evil, 
I'm going to use that same trait of my zeal, of my, my zealous passion, my unrelented just tenacity. I'm going to use it to have my focus on Christ. Take that same tenacity, baby. I'm going to harness it right here. That's pretty awesome. You can take your sinful action, take the core of what caused it, the core of how it was being, what, what was behind fueling it, and get that same fuel, but use it now to fuel the engine of your spiritual focus. Take that character trait of tenacity in his case, of wanting to persecute people, pursue them. Let's, let's, not, let's, let's pursue and, perse and prosecute our own bodies and our own minds and souls to be buffeted, to keep focus on that, that crosshair. So my reward in Christ. Wow. What an image Paul gives. It's unbelievable. He's basically saying the tenacity, the zeal, the effort, the, 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 the lack of concern for anybody else that I had when I was looking to hunt those people down and kill them, I do the same thing and more to gain Christ. That's scary. They're like, dude, that, you were scary then. And he goes, oh, that wasn't nothing. What I'm doing now, oh, if you were to measure, if you could only see inside of me, you just don't see the same manifested outward things because that was an outward evil manifestation. This is an inward spiritual manifestation you can't see. But I know who does see. My dad, my father in heaven, he sees. Oh, man, Paul is really, he's just, wow. And that's why Paul says he wants to be found by searching to be clinging not to his own righteousness, but to that which is Christ. He wants to be conformed to his death. He talks about stretching in verse 13 of chapter 3 like a runner. Like, again, you stretch everything you can at the last minute, and you they, they say in horse racing, got him by a nose, you know. But I remember, like, there's an old Jerry Seinfeld comedy. It's a hilarious skit he does, and he goes, you ever notice how Olympics, they're just in a sprint between the gold medal and the bronze medal is like this. First, second, third. Because <laughs> it's funny. Because it's true. There's like this much of a millisecond between first, second, third when there's written down that, down that track. And Paul's saying, that's why, man. I don't know. I don't know if I'm first, second, third. I don't know. I don't care about that. Here's what I do know. I'm going to run, baby. I'm going to stretch. At the very end, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stretch it out. So ever I, I don't, I'm not looking this way. I'm not looking that way. I'm looking this way. I'm just going to stretch it all out. Wherever I end up, I end up. But I'm not going to ever have regrets. I'm not going to have remorse. I'm not going to have weeping gnash and give teeth. I'm going to leave it all out there. I'm going to buffet myself. I'm going to persecute myself. I'm going to have my laser focus. I'm going to put it all out there, man. I'm putting all, I'm, I'm, I'm putting all my, all my lot on Christ. Not just Christ who loves me. No, 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 no. He already knows that. He's saying, because the Christ that loves me, I will never devalue or allow someone else to devalue me from what he has given me about who he is and what his word says. I don't care how ostracizing it sounds to you. I don't care how uniquely different it is to you. I don't care how misunderstanding it is for you. As Peter would say, I don't care how deep it is for you. It doesn't change the fact that it's still the race that I am running. And still, I'm going to run it the right way. I'm going to run it to the, my very last breath. I'm going to stretch out every fiber of my being until I hear that gun sound. Until I hear that tape. Until that gun sounding, until that tape is, 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 is passed. Until the very last, my last breath is breathed. I'm not, I'm not stopping. So Paul is this tremendously awesome picture. And in verse 15 he says, I'm not, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfected. Ongoingly perfect. But I've had moments. But have I sustained it? No! No way have I sustained it. Am I telling you I'm constantly running this way? No. I'm saying that's my goal. Do I get off track? Yes. But I go back back onto that track. I know what I know what right looks like. I get back on track again. Have I experienced it? Yes. Have I sustained it? No. <laughs> I wish. It's not possible. We're sinners. He says, but be joined imitators in verse 17. But in verse 16, before that, he said, you know, it doesn't matter in verse 15 and 16 if you think differently than him. He said, you know what? The previous things you learned before, j just walk by that situation. So everything I've said to people, if they heard me today or last week, and they said, I don't understand what you're saying. It doesn't matter. Walk and strive in the way Paul's describing within the context of your measure of grace and faith. That's the point. I don't care if you're in the Special Olympics or in the Olympics. It doesn't matter. 
run to win. Prepare to represent yourself with respect and with value. That you're the best that God's made you to be within the context of your measure of grace and, great grace and faith, within your abilities of your role and responsibility. So in verse 18, he talks about, again, he's weeping about these people whose end will be the destruction and their shame because they're engrossed in earthly things as they're minding the things of earth. This is the imagery of that which is choked by the thorns of the seed that was sown in Mark 4 in verses 18 and 19. But he says, no, our, our citizenship's in heaven. It's in heaven. So he's looking out to, again, that our, our polity, our calling is there, not here. I don't care where I sit at the table now. I don't care if I'm recognized or not now. Is it, is it nice to be recognized? Sure. But it doesn't, it's not my focus. It doesn't matter. If you want to give it to me, great. But it's not the point. I want to be recognized by God. I want to be recognized by the Father when I pass the inspection at the shoveling experience. I want to hear that I can actually pass into the diaper line. That's what I want. The seat that I want, Paul would say, not at the one at the royal family, not at the one at the bride's table and this earthly wedding. Oh, no, no. I want the seat next to the bridegroom and the best wedding heavenly celebration of all time. That's where my citizenship is, he says. That's where I belong. That's where we've been called to. I'm not going to attend a wedding and let that chance slip through my fingers. You got another thing coming. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. He's saying it's not about me. It's about Christ. And I will be doggone if I'm going to take what he gave to me, let it slip through my fingers. The amount of blessings he's given me, I'm going to grab hold of it with all my dear life, my friends. That's what he says. In verse 21, he'll transform the outward body. He has the energy, he says, by the power, the power in action to subject us. So that again, he places us in order, hupotasso. Christ places us in order. The th that's what it means by subject. I love that word, hupotasso. It's better than subject all things. It should say better English. The last part of verse 21 of chapter 3, he's able even to subject the things in the proper order, all things to himself. But you see, in English, if it said that, you would go, whoa, proper order of things. You mean there's tiers and different levels and degree? Yes. What makes you think God's not a God of order? Do the clouds just shoom, fly out of the sky? No. The birds just go and then stop flying and go no. Do you just stop walking? What happens? Something wrong? What happens? Well, it's a blind. Babe, what do you mean? What happened? What did you do? Right here. Oh, right here, babe. That's okay. That's okay. It's fine. You're fine. You, this has probably hit something. It's fine. So, as you as you go through this whole process, how it all ends up, we're at the end of it, so it's okay for the timing of that. So, I thought there was a technical issue, but it, there wasn't. But Paul's just telling us at the end of chapter 3, as he's going through this rem memory of things, he's telling us to take account and take stock and to just remembering not only is the pressing on for this prize, but to remember that there's those around us that unfortunately don't have that same zeal. And if we don't watch ourselves, they could take us down with them. But at the same time, we're supposed to still have empathy and compassion and mourn with them. And, and Paul just is like, oh my gosh. Why do they think this way? But remember Mark 4, 18 and 19, because the cares of this world is thorns. It choked the word and made it unproductive, which means it was productive. It became unproductive. What would cause someone to know the secrets of the kingdom of the God, to know the depth of who God is, depth of God's word different at a greater level, and then take that and then have it choked out? What would cause that? Well, Paul told you what would cause that. Epaphrodites lived it. It's the depression because the suffering, because you're being attacked for what you understand about God and his word by the majority of the 90% plus people who will label you a heretic, a heretical, a heretic, a cult person, a weirdo, a freaky do, whatever they want to call you. They will ostracize you, make fun of you, argue with you, condescend you, smear you, murmur against you, talk underneath their breath about you. Paul says it's very hard to stand up against that. Peer pressure is real. Social, sociology is real. We all want self-belonging. 
and when our own people in Christ in the same spirit of our Father in heaven don't want to accept us for who we are and because we can be at the same loving foundation but yet be different in our distinctive belief systems of who God is in his word, but they want to just divide us and label us and condescend us because of it, that's heartbreaking. It could even cause a person, oh, I don't know, to become unproductive and decide it's not worth it anymore. I'm not going to pursue God anymore in that way. I'm not going to pursue the scripture in that way. It's an easier way of, of going when I swim with the current. I'd rather not go against the current. Because you're telling me there's an island in the middle of the ocean I can't see anyways. It's on no map. And you're telling me to swim that way. I see no land. There is no land mapped out. No Navy guys ever said it exists. Nobody who's been at sea claims it exists. But you're telling me God showed you it existed. That's how they think of us and what we see God, how we see God's word. It's too unreal. It's too ridiculous to believe is true. They'd rather go the way that's most traveled by than the road that's least traveled by because there's more safety in numbers, they believe. So they don't want to go against the grain because it just destroys their soul. So the truth that God gave them that they did once walk with becomes unproductive. And they, loose, they hold loose the, the truth about who God is and his word and go right back into their comfort zone nestled in to the common churchianity viewpoint. And Paul is warning people about, don't do that, folks. It's a dangerous reality. We're going to go into chapter 4 on Sunday and conclude this book with one more chance to review it as we do that as well. Yes? When you say that to that sin, that's going to be the impression. That's what many people believe. Babe, you already said that. Oh, I'm sorry. It's all right. And did I read at times? No, I don't know. What is that? In, in verse 17, there's a phrase that Paul says to be imitators of me. Yeah, well, I get, well he's, what he's saying is imitators of him, meaning suffer faithfully through the hardships because of what you believe. Look how they're treating him. Look how they're looking at him. And he's, he's bucking up. He's not cowering down. He's not being like the thorn, ch choking the word and being unproductive. He's still being productive. He's writing books. He's witnessing to people with joy. He's living in joy. He's writing down the truth. He's not letting the evidence around him of the hatred and the malice because of what he believes about God and his word to stop his zeal for living and believing and trusting in Christ. That's what he means by being joint imitators. So when he says imitators of me, he doesn't mean from his past life. He's not saying of me. It sounds weird. I know what you're saying. It sounds like he's talking about you know, some prideful thing. He doesn't, mean, he doesn't mean me his whole life. He means the me that God made him into these last couple of years. To your point. That's what he's talking about. He's, he's not meaning the me, the totality of who Paul is. He's talking about the, the, not the whole Saul of Tarsus, who's also Paul. He means this, this version of Paul that's now been the way that God has changed and forged in him, this one new man. Uh, that version of him, be imitators of that version of him. To, to your point, it's a great, I think it's what you're saying, but it's a good point. So, so with that being said, we'll, we'll, we'll pray and close, and if there are any other things we can um, have a questions or gleanings on, we'll do that, but let's close and pray at this time. So Father, we thank you for this time we've had together to, again, to learn and reflect on your word from Philippians chapters 2 and 3. You can even keep us in your and your peace and your love and your compassion in our lives and continue to help us to walk, think, live, be changed, and understand the relationship with you, other people, as to what's supposed to drive us to filter all these things you tell us, all this deeper truth, understanding about you and your word is supposed to lead us to that, that depth of relating and identifying with how you lived and loved us. And as you did that, as you were also teaching us this depth, we should do and understand that that's our commandment likewise. So when we walk this life out with that sense of vetting ourselves and seeing ourselves in the way we need to continue that foundation of love, but to build on it knowledge and discernment in how we live, how we understand how we represent you and how we interact with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, particularly those of like-minded faith, of like-minded insight into that heavenly calling. And may we also, lastly, Father, have that hair, cross-hair focus like Paul had, that scopios, that, that sense of we acknowledge the depth of truth around us that you've given us in our heart, mind, spirit, and our lives. The depth of love you've given us, but that focus above all things is you. Not what you can give us, just you. We just want more of you to be able to wherever you are, we want to be. As close as we can. We thank Father, we thank you for that. Thank you for the opportunity that you give to us to just even know anything about you at all, let alone the things you've shown us. We're unworthy 
we all deserving, but we're grateful and we're thankful. So we ask all this and pray this in Jesus, Yeshua's name. Amen.